upload it later. All right. Whenever you're ready. Uh, good All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to the uh, September public meeting of ANC's 5D um, Zoning and Development Committee. Today is uh, Thursday, September 16th. Time is uh, 7.30 p.m. Just like to welcome everybody. Um, we had a two month break um, uh, mirroring the AMC's public meeting calendar schedule. So we're just getting up to speed. There are a lot of uh, items on tonight's agenda. Uh, so we'll uh, try to jump into it as quickly as possible. Uh, there are, just to refresh the, we are gonna have a presentation by uh, second stage PUG by the uh, development for the Gallaudet Union Market. Uh, there's gonna be a PUG presentation for 1801 to 1805 Maryland Ave Northeast. And I think once we get through those presentations, there's some smaller projects that I'd like us to uh, discuss that we've been asked to review some plans, um, uh, time permitting. I, I'm, I understand it is, is the evening and I'll try to be as respectful as for people's um, schedules um, as much as possible. I think there's um, a lot of people here, a lot of people here from the Gallaudet at Union Market. So maybe I'll just be respectful of the majority of the people's time. So let me hand it over to whoever uh, uh, would like to uh, speak from uh, on behalf of the um, of, of that PUD application. All right, thank you. Um, and if we could, if you could share your screen, if we could put a presentation up. Sure. Um, I just actually promoted some of the panelists by mistake, but that's um, her <laughs> co-host. I'm going through it uh, right now as we're doing this. When I see anyone showing up in the attendees list. I'm just promoting to a panelist that way they can share their screen and unmute. Okay, great. So Robbie, if you wanna pull up the presentation and I'll kick it off if that works. Uh, it says host disabled participants screen share. Okay, so I will, whoever wants to present, I, I will promote you to a co-host. So let me know That's who me. wants to, uh, could you say your name? Robbie Sacklerita, the confusing one earlier. Gotcha, no, no worries, oh, there you go. All right, I'm gonna promote you to a co-host and that will allow you to present. Great. Okay, so I'll, I'll start off while... So Christine Roddy um, with Wilston and Stores and I'm here tonight with representatives of JBGS and Gallaudet to present the second stage PUD application for PUD and Union Market, consisting of parcels that are owned by Gallaudet. And you can see in the map that's on the screen, the four parcels that were approved as a first stage PUD by the Zoning Commission are um, being shown by the cursor. They're in the darker colors there. So the first stage, this is a two stage PUD as I indicated, and the first stage PUD was approved by the Zoning Commission for the four parcels that straddle um, 6th Street and we are here tonight to present the second stage application for two of the parcels. And that's parcel, what we call parcel two, which is being shown by the cursor, and parcel three on the other side of Sixth Street, which is also being shown by the cursor. And we are, are also here to present modifications of that first stage approval for parcels one, two, and three. Parcel one is the one at the corner of Florida and Sixth. So as you may already be aware, the um, first stage that was approved, first stage PUDs typically deal with the massing of a project. They focus on height, density, uses, site plans. And then the second stage application, which we're presenting this evening, focuses primarily on building design. So we have a lot to discuss. So I would encourage you to look at the materials that have been filed with the Zoning Commission, um, because what we are presenting tonight in the interest of time would just be an overview. So with that, I um, will turn it to Sam Swiller with Gallaudet to give um, an overview of the parcel one portion of the project. Oh, and I'm sorry, Sam, before I turn it to you, I will also note that three hearings have been um, scheduled for this application in November. Thank you, Christine. So yes, parcel one um, was it's part of the modification. Um, so as you can see that the picture on the left shows what was originally approved. We're now um, proposing to do a larger cultural center building on the corner that will be part of a later 
PUD stage two document. But tonight we're gonna to talk about the open space that was at this intersection of six in Florida, we were calling it Gateway Plaza. After much study, we realized that it was just a too, too much conjecture at that corner and not, not necessarily the common uh, open space that we were inspiring to make. So we're now doing what's called Creativity Way, which will be roughly, it's the area highlighted by light blue. It's roughly 20,000 square feet of open space. That's gonna be um, sort of a like landscape and garden with some, um, some beautiful sculptural elements, lots of outdoor seating, lots of shelter, uh, lots of places where you could grab a sandwich and just uh, enjoy a uh, break in your work. Um, very much a place that you can learn about um, Gallaudet University and what our culture is about. So we're really excited about this project. In order to make Creativity Way, we had to do a campus plan amendment, which has been submitted alongside the stage two PUD for parcels two and three. The amendment, um, in addition to creating this campus, um, this open space, is also doing a couple of other things. One is just transferring roughly 6,000 square feet of campus land to parcel two. Um, that's on the northern side, right where the cursor is. It's, um, it's a shift that we made in order to complete the parcels. It was a strip of land that's not really used by the university. Um, in addition, we are building a memorial to the Black Death experience at Gallaudet, and it's currently called Kendall Division II. Um, it's a memorial meant to, um, to honor those who fought for inclusion in, uh, in deaf education for the Black community. Um, and we're currently about to begin fundraising for that. Another thing we had to do was we had to move Tapscott Road, which is cutting through the middle of Postal 2. This was in response to a, a request by the Office of Planning. So in order to make that move, we had to modify the campus plan adjacent to it. And then finally, we're because of um, the timing of our current campus plan, which ends at the end of 2022, we're asking for a five-year extension to our campus plan so that we can get our colleagues, my colleagues together to start planning for our next campus plan, but also to be able to do it in, um, in a way that we can plan for the post-COVID uh, world. Hopefully we get there very soon. So um, all these elements are gonna be in our campus plan amendment. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to a member of the Olson Cundit team. Oh, oh Bobby, I have much. go ahead. You guys are stuck with me. I'll try not to butcher the design too much. Uh, these are just some visuals of creativity way that show the vibrant open space imagined by the university. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Robbie Saclarius. I'm the development manager with JBG Smith. Um, really excited to bring this project to life in partnership with Gallaudet. So thank you all for your time. I'm trying to cram a lot into a short period of time here. So first to reorient you to um, sort of the existing conditions of the two parcels that are going through the stage two review, parcels two and three. They are on either side of Sixth Street. Parcel three is the surface lot, parking lot in front of Union Market. And parcel two is the above grade uh, parking deck on the across Sixth Street to the east adjacent to Gallaudet that's currently utilized by Gallaudet. Um, so both parking lots. Um, and a quick summary of our community benefits and amenities. Um, this was approved in our first stage PUD with the full support of the ANC and the Office of Planning that continues to support our stage two. Um, it's a lot of highlights. Uh, first in the neighborhood development, as I just mentioned, it's currently just the parcels are used as parking. So no, no residents are being displaced as part of this project. All of the housing, affordable housing, maker space, deaf entrepreneur, retail space are all net new to the neighborhood. Uh, affordable housing, uh, approximately 95 units as part of these two parcels will be set aside in the IZ program. The majority of those are at the 50% affordability level. So that comes uh, to over 11% of IZ. Um, we've executed a first source agreement to prioritize the hiring of DC residents throughout the construction process. 
We've got 10,000 square feet of uh, retail dedicated to maker space at a discount to market rents. 5,000 square feet set aside for deaf or entrepreneurs, deaf or hard of hearing art entrepreneurs. We're doing a lot to improve the pedestrian experience in and around our parcels and especially on 6th Street. That includes 65,000 square feet of open space, um, uh, including Creativity Way that Sam just mentioned. Um, we've uh, narrowing 6th Street to really prioritize the pedestrians and make it a safe place. So narrowing that right of way to slow traffic, installing a protected bike lane that will connect to the existing bike infrastructure around the neighborhood. Um, a tabletop crossing that will serve as a, a speed table to slow traffic, um, as well as a highlighted pedestrian connection. Um, and then a few um, initiatives with DDOT for traffic mitigation, like traffic cameras and increased signaling around our parcels. Um, and last but not least, sustainability, our project will be LEED certified and include solar panels. So jumping over to the design, which is the focus of our stage two, starting on the east side of 6th Street with parcel two. Um, and these are these three low rise buildings. Uh, the challenge and opportunity that uh, really exists as for the architects and designers of this project is to make a transition from a historic bucolic campus um, to a more gritty industrial historic market. And so I think we've done the designers have done a great job, and I hope I don't butcher their vision here. But, so we've taken on uh, hues and colors of the earthiness presented in, in brick on campus and sort of interpreted that with the modern materiality of metal panel here. Um, so taking on the warm tones and also the charcoal tones from the rooftops around, such as faculty row. So looking north, you see primarily these warmer tones and the weather here on the facade. Um, the, the southern two buildings are connected by a, a bridge and between those buildings is a space, uh, oh, public open space with um, a lot of lush planning with the Office of Planning has deemed a green finger, also serves as a portal back uh, to Creativity Way. And then looking from the north south, the northernmost building on parcel two is, is prominent here, um, which utilizes sort of a charcoal toned bricks and metal panel. And in the foreground, you can see the sort of tabletop crossing that makes um, a more safe, curbless environment for pedestrians. Um, and so this area sort of shows how the two parcels relate to each other in their surrounding context, particularly in massing. You'll see uh, the three parcel two buildings are lower rise and serve as a transition from the campus um, stepping up to the higher density zone parcels throughout the market. So jumping across the street to parcel three, um, this also, uh, the facade sort of emulates this transition from campus to, um, to industrial market aesthetic um, by utilizing brick and metal, but uh, facing the campus, the facade is primarily brick with metal accents, and then weaves together facing north and south, the transition to face west towards the market, um, a, a predominantly metal facade with brick accents. Uh, Top Scott Street is being realigned, as Sam mentioned, and runs through this parcel. So we've connected the building on either side through this sort of iconic bridge. Um, and introduces some fun marches to the, to the mega frame. Um, this slide shows a little more of the pedestrian experience around this parcel. I think the architects have done a great job carving out really unique spaces for the public to experience. On the left is what we're calling an arcade, so this covered open space. And then you can also see uh, sort of what the experience will be like in and around the bridge and tap spot. On the right is Tapscott, which is a curbless sort of lunar area with a specialty tapestry paving. Um, it's a really intimate space, which also includes these little conversation eddies and places for um, deaf and hard of hearing folks to step aside and have signing conversations. Um, moving along to our streetscape, this is sort of an overview of both parcels together and our streetscape improvements going all the way up. Sixth Street, 
Um, zooming into six in particular, um, here you'll see the protected bike lane here, um, as well as this tabletop crossing um, from Neil from Tax Scott to Neil. Uh, Neil Place, this is currently, so this is the Union Market building to the north on the top of the page, and this is our parcel three to the south. And this is sort of where the picnic tables are today at, at the market. So we're just going to improve that and it'll still be dedicated as a public open space. And lastly, the green finger that we sort of saw in rendering below the bridge, um, this is sort of just shown in plan view or we'll have those same sort of conversation eddies but surrounded by lush plantings and serve as this portal um, and connection to creativity by. So that's all. As Christine said, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a lot more uh, in our file and documents, uh, but we're happy to, to field any questions you guys have now. We have our entire um, development team with us, the architects, the transportation, everyone. So we are happy to answer any questions. Okay, I will defer first to the, uh, any commissioners who are on the, who have joined us, uh, I'll, I'll let them ask their questions first before we, uh, we fire away. I know um, Commissioner Rhodes, uh, who single member district encompasses this, uh, she had to work this evening, so she, she will not be in attendance. Um, but I think we do have some other commissioners who are here. Hey, Kevin, it's Commissioner Hoffman. Uh, I had a question about the amount of affordable housing. Um, I know 11% is above the minimum requirement, and that is great. Uh, is it at all possible we could see something closer to 15% and maybe adjust the percentages that we're using to uh, have what we would say is affordable, but maybe in actuality may not actually be affordable? Uh, you know, 80% is, is quite high. I, I struggle to believe that that's actually affordable. Right. You're cutting out. Are you, are you still with us? I'm here. Yeah. Is, okay. Can you hear? Yes. Yes. That's okay. I think I heard the, the whole um, question. So the affordable housing set aside was approved as part of this first stage, and it was a result of a very lengthy process uh, with the zoning commission and the AMC, and ultimately the benefits and amenities approved were deemed commensurate with the flexibility being requested. Uh, it's also important to note the affordable housing is part of a broader package of benefits and amenities being considered. Um, the ANC raised other issues important to the community, including employment and traffic mitigation, pedestrian safety, all of which are also being addressed uh, as part of our project. And as part of the second stage uh, application that we have filed, we have raised the amount of affordable that um, is being provided. The original approval was for 10%. And so we have increased it to that 11%. Um, and again, just to most of the PDs that are moving forward now, the entire set aside is at the 60% AMI level or MFI level. And so I just wanted to reiterate that 70% of the units set aside as IZ will be at the 50% MFI level, which is the lowest MFI level available in the IZ program. Could, could you just, uh, there's lots of percentages, could you just tell us how many units, um, like first of all, how many total units are being delivered just to, to everybody? And then how many units will be, and if, there's, and if I heard you correctly, you're saying, because I know in the original phase one, there was some units that were 50% MFI, and there were some units 80%. If I heard you correctly, you're saying now it'll just all be 60%. And there's a, a number, or did I not hear you correctly? No, so I'm sorry. I was saying that most of the PUDs going forward now, it is all 60%, but this one is not. So this one will maintain that 50-80 split with 70% of the units being at the 50% level. And so there are approximately 95 units. Um, and you can see on the slide, 67 of those units will be at or below 50% MFI and 28 would be at the 80% level. And again, those are approximate numbers as the unit numbers shift, but the percentage that we are at is 11%. I had a question and I don't know if you guys could hear me earlier because I think I lost the connection a little bit. 
Uh, but I, mine is just about the unit mix for the affordable units. Um, you know, what size uh, units are we talking about here? Or is it, or have you not gotten to that? We so have it, so it'll, it'll mirror the, the affordable mix will be, will mirror the same mix of the market rate. So there, okay. and that's part of the IZ requirement. There aren't any like carving aside special different units for um, yeah. affordability. It'll be the same mix and the same average size for the affordable units. Yeah. Do you have any kind of inkling of what you're leaning towards in terms of unit mix at all yet? Well, I, it'll, be a, it'll be a true mix because we do want to target those young professionals who may want a studio, but also those families looking for three bedrooms. Um, I know a lot of the recent developments have been heavy on studios and we definitely yeah. won't be doing micro units or anything like that. Um, so we are looking at a true mix. Um, we're not, okay. no details to share yet. Okay. All right. I, well, I, I like the general direction. Um, I'll say that because I think you struck on exactly um, my concern is, you know, I don't want to see too much of the studio micro unit, that kind of thing. So thanks. Um, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned um, about uh, the a chain, an extension of the campus plan being having a five year extension, and that I'm just unfamiliar. What is the campus plan, and how does that relate to Office of Planning? That's a question for Sam. <laughs> you mentioned earlier there was a you know there was a, a, a Gallaudet campus plan that goes until the end of 2022. And I'm just, I'm just unsure what is that? How does that relate to the Office of Planning? And you mentioned it had to be, you needed to apply for an extension, a five-year extension. Yes. Um, so the Office of Planning oversees campus plans. They're the ones that advise uh, all the institutions that had campus plans before they go in front of the Zoning Commission. I would um, mention that most campus plans are either of 20 to 15-year durations. Gallaudet has historically always done shorter durations, 10 years or so. Um, we're, if anything, becoming more in line with what's the normal duration for a campus plan with this extension. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that explanation. Um, I have a question. Um, my name is Andrew Graham, and I'm one of the architects on the um, Zoning and Development Committee. And in full disclosure, I do work with uh, JBG on other projects, uh, but I have a question about how security will be handled in the in this campus plan moving forward. Um, the rendering suggests that it's kind of it's kind of open from Sixth Street onto the campus, and right now I know that there's there's a fence around the campus. Is the intent to have a kind of a porous campus edge along Sixth Street? Or uh, that's a great question, and it's a philosophical one for the university. We have, um, since 1968, have had gates around our fences. Uh, originally, it was, you know, to secure the campus and keep uh, the students safe. I think now, if anything, it's to keep the neighborhood safe and keep the students on campus. But um, now that we're kind of wrestling with what we want to do long term, there is definitely a push to make the campus more open and part of the community. And we see Creativity Way as a first step in that direction. It's very much meant to be a bridge to the community. So we're, the way we're securing it is um, there's going to be gates, but they're going to be open during daylight hours. So anybody can walk onto Creativity Way and if they wanted to, onto the campus. We're going to have to do some wrestling with how do we mitigate traffic so that it, it doesn't necessarily become a the dog park for the neighborhood. That's a huge, huge concern of ours, but we do want it to make it um, a public amenity. Yeah, I think that I think that's an exciting step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. How do we think the construction um, will affect the, the current union market businesses. I mean, obviously a lot of um, attendees, customers who, who go to union market, they're relying upon that parking lot. 
um, like when do you expect that parking lot to be fenced off? You know, like how far out is that right now? And and, and what are the mitigation plans to, to minimize the impact of businesses and, and the neighbors of who, who who work there right now and have businesses there? Yeah, that's a great question. And we've been in close contact with the property Edens, the property owner of Union Market, um, a lot this past year as we've been planning and designing our space and the open space around it. Uh, they actually own half of Neil Place. So that's been a very collaborative process with them. Um, and so the, I guess for, there's, there's a few answers or there's a few um, sort of issues in, in your question. One I think is parking. So the, the parking, I have, there's a parking supply chart I could show you, but essentially as we lead up to our construction, a lot of other buildings are coming online that have a large amount of public parking in them, um, awarded by the TIF. There's a tax, tax increment of financing that was awarded to Union Market to fund public parking for this purpose. So I think 300 of those spaces will be delivered by the time we break ground, which would, is much more than what's currently on our surface lot. Um, and more will come as we're under construction and then 150 spaces in our development will be dedicated public parking to replace the public parking that's there now. Second is sort of like the experience. Um, and we, um, JBD is, we're very used to being our own worst enemy in uh, development versus asset management and the operating. Um, we always develop around operating buildings that we also own. So we've come up with our own standards to keep the surrounding environment a pleasant one to be in. And the, that primarily means a, a really nice construction fence. So a taller plywood fence rather than a chain link fence. Um, and we've been talking with Edens about even applying, you know, public art by local artists to that fence facade to make it, you know, still feel like Union Market and a place where you want to be. Um, so I hope that answers some of the questions. Um, it does, and I appreciate the, you know, the, the idea of employing some uh, local artists. I know ANC 5D has been giving, giving some um, uh, grants to do some public art uh, with an ANC 5D. So if you coordinate with Commissioner Moore, the other commissioners, they, they will probably have some recommendations of local artists uh, to do some of the uh, streetscape while during uh, construction is underway. Um, yes, yeah, that will do, so please email me. <laughs> That would be great. Um, we're, we're far out. Another part of your question was when we break ground and part of that's up to sort of the public process going forward. But um, we're hoping to break ground in late next year or early 23. And so we'll be under construction for roughly two and a half years and deliver in 2025. So we'll come to you for those um, artist ideas and recommendations in about a year, probably. And is, is the construction gonna be, uh, uh, concurrent between all the buildings? Is it one development that you're looking on doing or is it going to be sort of phased, different buildings that de delivered at different times? That's also a good question. So the, the, there's the two parcels are technically kind of four buildings. Parcel two and three are going to go together because such a big part of our project is really making Sixth Street a better place. So we wanted to get both sides of it, a good chunk on both sides done in our first phase. So um, there will be two separate contractors though. So um, six on the east side, parcel two is wood frame. Parcel three is, um, is a concrete building. And it's, it was a little much for one contractor to, to take on. So we've got multiple, we have two architects and two contractors, um, but they'll go simultaneously um, to have one large delivery. And is, I guess, is it gonna be the two building sites and then come down and finish Sixth Street separately or is Sixth Street gonna be shut? I assume it's not shut down the no, whole No, it's not shutting down. Um, that's the benefit of having like an extra wide Sixth Street right now for construction. So we're just taking off the parallel parking spaces. Um, the travel lanes on Fifth and Sixth will both remain throughout construction. So there'll be no impact to the traffic lanes um, there. Thank you. I'm curious, how many public parking, just because that's what most neighbors will want to know, how many existing surface parking spots are in that parcel? That way we can say to people, well, there's this number now, there'll be this many more when it's all done. How many spots are in those parking lots right now? 
Sam, do you know? I want to say it's around a hundred on the surface lot now, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. Well, yeah. So the parking lot, the we we call it the overflow parking lot. Um, the one that you use to park at the uh, Market. It, it at its maximum capacity can hold two seventy spaces but it has not been in its maximum capacity because of various staging for construction um for, for a huge chunk of the summer there was um soul cycle on the site um so robbie is right the number is like around 150 so it will feel like um a net net no change in the number of parking I do want to leave some time um, for the other PUD application. Um, do any of the other commissioners have any other questions for um, for this uh, presentation? None from me. I'll just comment that overall it seems to be a very well thought out project. And I do appreciate the uh, concern that you all have shown for some of the commission's priorities, especially around hiring. Okay, so um, we're going to move on to the next item, the, uh, item on the agenda, which was a presentation for um, a PUD uh, proposed for 1801 to 1805 Maryland Ave Northeast. Um, can whomever wants to present, please speak up and let me know. Hey, Jar. Yeah, I, I can share my oh, screen, uh, Sabrina oh, hey, Nagel. Hi, Sabrina. Great. I think Hi. I need to promote you to a, uh, a co-host if I haven't already done this. Sure. Sabrina. And um, those of you who wish to leave, uh, you, uh, please feel free. I know you all need to go um, get on to dinners and enjoy your evenings here. Um, I'm going to make you a co host, Sabrina, so that should allow you to share your screen. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'll just quickly jump in and introduce everybody. Um, I'm Jared. I um, want to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to present our project at 1801 1805. Um, we are um, here to, uh, we're, pers we're pursuing zoning relief from the Board of Zoning and Adjustments um, for, um, uh, we have a hearing scheduled in November. We've submitted an application for a special exception, essentially shifting um, the split zone zoning boundary that's um, on 1801 which current about 35 feet east. 1801 predominantly is zoned MU7 with a portion of it zoned for RE2 and 1805 is RE2. And so by pursuing this, we believe um, the relief will allow us to deliver a development with more affordable units and a more interesting design um, to help us overcome a lot of the obstacles that we face that are existing. Our team is, consists of me, myself, um, Sam, who's, uh, very busy tonight. And then um, we brought our design team, Square 134, um, with Ron Schneck and Sabrina Nagel. And at this point, I'm just going to hand it over to them um, to really dive in on the details and walk everybody through the design. Hi. Uh, before Sabrina starts, I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, again, thank you, Jared. Um, thank you, um, Commissioners. My name is Ron Schneck. Um, I'm principal of Square 134 Architects. Um, uh, we've been around for 15 years. We've done a lot of projects um, in and around the H Street area, um, and we're excited to be involved um, in this project. Um, I'll quickly, um, I'm going to let Sabrina go through sort of the design intention and sort of where we are in the design. I wanted to quickly go over the zoning um, sort of aspect that we're here for um, briefly, and then we can follow up with additional questions. So Sabrina, if you don't mind, um, so this is, we'll get into the design in a little bit. If you could go to uh, this is the site, um, obviously. Okay, so if you're not familiar with the um, with with where we are, uh, as you come up Maryland Avenue, um, there's the Aldi um, on the right, and uh, Orange. Um, those those two existing buildings. Um, that's our site. And what we're what we're here about is, um, and this this happens. We've actually done this a, um, a couple times. Um, the, the, the zone lines um, don't always fall on property lines, and so um, within the zoning regulations. Um, there's, you know, they've anticipated that. And so if you can go to the next slide um, and what, what mechanism they have in place um, is basically um, it's a special exception um, to ask to sort of 
um, you know, acknowledge the property line and zone line as long as you're within sort of this 35 feet radius. Um, and again, this is a diagram just showing that. Um, and then next page, um, actually just go to the zoning real quick. Mm -hmm. um, just sort of real, um, other than that, um, this is a by right project. Um, we do have in the in the lower right, and obviously this is very preliminary, but um, you know, we and, and if there's questions about specific zoning issues, I'll be glad to go over them. Um, but just wanted to mention that everything's by right. And then in the lower right, um, again, we're still working it out, but we have the um, IZ calculations. Um, if there's any questions about um, the, IZ, the IZ units that we um, are providing. Um, and with that, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to the um, project designer, uh, Sabrina Nagel. And again, thank you for your time. Hi everyone, thanks Ron. Um, so this is the main facade on Maryland Avenue. Um, so with this project, we are treating both lots accordingly with their respective zoning constraints. So that means that the MU7 or 1801 Maryland Ave is complying with the 65 foot height limit plus a 12 foot penthouse. Uh, whereas the RA2 or 1805 side is complying with the 50 foot height limit plus a 12 foot penthouse and then the allowable three feet for mechanical space on top of that. So for, well, in terms of the design, we do have a continuous base that actually wraps to the west facade. Um, in addition to this floating bay where we are maximizing windows, um, we're trying to get optimal natural light on the inside for those units. Um, and this is a great opportunity to do so. Uh, one main goal of the project is to provide as many opportunities for private outdoor space as possible. So we do have these balconies seen throughout the project. Um, this is the west facade uh, where that material wraps. So we have a bit of a unique condition because we do have a 16 foot easement on this side. So that means below this easement, we are allowed to put um, window openings, but anything above that would be considered an at-risk window. So for the time being, we are leaving this uh, facade without windows but in the future, we would like to continue to design this um, as it is a pretty prominent um, facade as you're going down Maryland Avenue. Um, and due to that constraint, we did create this light well. Um, so we have these setback balconies, again, maximizing the window coverage so that we get as much natural light in there as possible for these units on this facade. Since this wall is essentially a party wall um, on the property line uh, adjacent to a future development. So this is the rear facade. Again, another kind of floating projection, maximizing some windows here, um, providing more of these balconies seen on the front of the facade. This is on the 1805 side. And as you can see on the east facade, we also have those balconies wrapping on the 1801 side. Um, and in many cases, uh, once on the front facade, once here, we're trying to be respectful to the uh, surrounding context. So this material will wrap and kind of align with the adjacent structure. These are the two main views from up and down Maryland Avenue. Um, you can better see that material wrapping around uh, and where we will further develop this facade because like I said before, it is very prominent from this street. Um, and you can also get a better sense of that kind of light well on that west facade. A uh, quick site plan. So we do have three parking spots that we're providing. One is an accessible space. Uh, one is a regular space and one is a car share space. Uh, we are also providing a pretty substantial rooftop amenity space. Um, that's on or adjacent to the penthouse of the 1801 building uh, or one lot. And we are also providing uh, some rooftop space for that penthouse on 1805. Uh, and we additionally have uh, allotted some space for that rooftop mechanical equipment, um, as you saw from the uh, north facade. So getting a little bit into the plans, um, this is the cellar floor and on each of the floors of this project, we do have uh, three pretty spacious two bedrooms and two one bedrooms, and that's consistent throughout the project. Um, and then the, the circulation core in the center with kind of offset stairs and elevator in the center. 
Uh, we are providing as many areaways as we can for the cellar units um, to provide, again, as much natural light as we can. Uh, the first floor is more or less the same, aside from the utility space beneath that's now a lobby for the first floor at the entry. A typical floor, um, we begin to introduce those balconies, so those can be seen from the second to the fourth floors. Um, and also kind of, again, you can see where we're maximizing the natural light for some of these units at that bay. And then as you move to the fourth floor, we shift the stairwell in a bit, um, accommodating some of the FAR constraints for the 1805 side and providing a little bit more unit space at that location. And finally, at the fifth floor, um, here is the penthouse space for 1805, which is designated for a unit. Um, and again, a lot of the, the rooftop space on either side. And then these three units at 1801 actually have a uh, private rooftop access to that substantial rooftop amenity space. Um, and you can again see that rooftop mechanical equipment on top of that penthouse of 1805. Um, so with that, I'd love to open it up to any comments or questions that you all may have. Thank you. Could you, uh, you mentioned there was very few windows on the western side due to an easement. And mm -hmm. then when I bring up a Google Street View, it looks like there's a street there. Is that not a is that is that not a public street? Is that private? Yeah, that you know, like why are you not allowed to put windows on the western facade? So, I can, yeah, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um so um about a little over a decade ago, um the there used to be an alley that extended from the existing alley um, on the south side of the unit. It went straight through to 17th. When Aldi came, they worked with the city and DDOT to close that so that Aldi could build their store. And in the process, they looped the alley to Maryland Avenue. And what happened was the city ultimately said, okay, Aldi, this is now your land but you have to grant the city a uh, perpetual public easement and you must maintain it and keep um, it clear 16 feet above the surface. And so technically that um, 1801 boundary line is up against private property with a public perpetual easement. And, and is there a plan to work with Aldi, will they allow you to put windows or you just, you have to give up on windows? Um, we're, we're certainly not giving up. Um, okay. Yeah, they, um, we, and we've been in touch with them in the past. There's been um, some turnover in their asset management department, um, but uh, we will continuously be reaching out to them. And um, perhaps even if it takes, doesn't even matter how long it takes, if, um, you know, if, if, if they, say, you know, give us permission, we work out an agreement, post um, construction permit, um, we'll put them in, we'll revise our CDs and put them in. Um, it's a top priority if we can work out something with Aldi. Another question I had, and this is a good view. So are, are all of the mechanicals, because I mean, it's, it looks like it's two separate buildings all, I assume it's, it'll all be constructed at the same time. Um, are all of the rooftop mechanicals for every unit, are they all in that one location there? That, that would be the intent, yes. Okay, gotcha. And do you have a 3D bird's eye view, a view that kind of shows the view down? It seemed like, I wasn't sure, you said that one of the buildings, which is zone MU7, that's allowed to be taller, but it almost looked like both buildings are almost the same height. Yeah, sorry, we, we don't have a bird's eye, but we do have these two perspectives where you could see it yeah. a little bit better. So it's probably because this penthouse um, is reaching up 12 feet from the 47 foot two of this side of the building. So it looks like it's very close to the top of this, especially with the lower bay here. So that's probably what it is from the front. It, it's kind of playing a trick on you because this is set back. Understood. That really won't be. Um, and is that 
so what are the special exceptions that are being requested as part of the this, this case? The special exception was Ron had touched on the 35 foot extension for the split zone. So this is actually a, a, a special exception uh, because this zone, we are, well, the zone boundary line, we would like to move to the property line between the two lots. So that, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that is the only special yeah, exception. I mean, in essence, what we're asking for is for the MU lot to um, allow the MU bulk and massing um, to comply and the RA2 lot stays as it is. And, and that, that's the special exception. Um, you know, taking that nine, that nine feet and essentially making that part of um, the MU requirements. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Um, I do have a couple of questions from, uh, from, from uh, Derek. Um, he's uh, one of the zoning committee members who's deaf and um, right now he doesn't have the, the um, there's a service where the person will speak on their behalf. It's not working right now. But his questions are, is the setback on the fifth floor penthouse facing Maryland Ave outdoor space, or will it be just left empty? Oh, that will be outdoor space. You're talking about on either side of this penthouse? This one? Um, let me reread. Is the setback on the fifth floor penthouse facing mm -hmm. Maryland Ave? Yes. Yes. There, yes. Like, yes. He, he put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah, so we, we would like this to be outdoor space accessible on both sides. Just to clarify, you know, we're, there's, um, we obviously have a green roof requirements and sort of the, the, the scheme, you know, the, you're going to experience this building from quite a distance. And the, the you know, the, the, the south side of the building is going to be very visible. And, 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 and the concept here is to get as much green roof and amenity space on the 1801 side and really hide um, any mechanical equipment on the 1805 side um, so that it's not as visible. So, um, you know, we're gonna, ideally these will be green space and it's either sort of, you know, for, for individual units or for sort of, you know, from some amenity space for all of you. Um, what is the total number of units being delivered and, and, and what, um, and how many of them will be inclusionary zoning or affordable? Kevin, before we answer that, oh, um, sure. Derek had a second question. Oh, sure. Uh, let me go back to it. Um, he asked, oh, can you confirm that all of the balconies will be accessible from the unit, rendering short windows not, uh, the rendering show windows, not doors? Yeah, so we will we'll develop that further as we move along with the design. But yeah, th this would essentially, you would have access to these balconies. Okay, so that's just a, uh, a, a draft right now. catch on Derek's part, yes. It's good catch, yeah. <laughs> Again, very early in the design process. Mm -hmm. Understood, thank you. And then we have, a, yeah, we have one question from Allison. Uh, Allison asks, 1809 is a three-story multi-unit building. What do you anticipate the impact will be on that building? Um, I, I, I can jump in, um, but Ron, Sabrina, and please augment um, or, or add on. Um, we think that, um, you know, the Aldi and um, everything from Starburst is very large and commercial and intensive. We view this whole row a sort of a transition into the neighborhood where 1801 um, is, has their uh, higher height and then you step down to 1805 and you step down further to 1809 and you're in the neighborhood. Um, our design uh, is to enhance and, and draw from the surrounding neighborhood. Um, so we think it's going to be a nice smooth transition and that's sort of what, what's one of our objectives. Yeah, I, I think that was a great summary, Jared. I mean, essentially, from a from a, a contextual perspective, um, that's exactly right. You know, as you as you continue, you know, north east on 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 Maryland, the uh, Aldi site is obviously going to be a much larger development. And so, the whole idea of the whole concept behind our project is to do exactly that: is to sort of be this this joint almost between sort of the larger context and then the sort of smaller scale three story residential as you as you go further along Maryland Avenue. 
Um, so yes, that was a good summary, Jared. Thank you. I have a question, and this is Commissioner Moore. I have a question about parking. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about what you're doing in terms of parking? Yeah, so I briefly touched on it, but I'll go back to the site plan. So we are providing three spaces, one accessible, one regular, and one car share. And the car share does count as three spaces. So technically we have a total of five, which is the requirement for these two lots together. Um, so that, that's pretty much the, the parking in a nutshell. It's a very difficult site to park. Um, we, we're really limited with what we can do. So, um, you know, we're, we're happy that we're able to get that amount in there. And it is, again, it is by right. Um, and what's the total number of units being delivered? And we what, have, how many of those units will be um, IZ or affordable? We have 29 units. It'll be 11 one bedroom and 18 two bedroom as we have it currently. Um, and we did some preliminary uh, IZ calculations. So the way you have to do it for the split for these two zones is calculate them separately, um, get the final square foot number and add those two together. So in total, we will have 1,936 square feet of IZ, which should be two to three units. Right now, our average unit size is fairly large. Um, it's about 950 square, it's over 950 square feet. Um, that's a conscious decision that um, we've made. And I think um, what it will lead to is probably more families that gravitate towards this project. And the, um, I'd like to go, I, I'm still a little confused about the penthouse on the 1805 side. So is that actual, if you go back to the rendering, mm -hmm. it was kind of a 3D rendering. Yep. Yeah. So is that, is that, is, are those units or is that, is it, or is that just um, a waiting for stairways area for people to get out and walk? Are, are those actual occupied, uh, I wasn't quite sure, but the, the, why it's so tall? Yeah, this we do have this as a unit currently as one okay. two bedroom. Um, we I'm sure in the future we can figure out if we want the public to also or, or the whole building to be able to access some of those spaces too, uh, because we have so much space in here. I'm sure we could make that work too, um, if need be. And then on top of you were just asking about the 1805, not 1801. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Because before I, when I saw it as a different uh, rendering color, I was like, okay, is it? But I didn't see any windows. I'm like, is that just like a large? Right. I wasn't sure what that was. Okay, so that is more units. Those will be windows. Yes. Um, it's just not okay. We have yet uh, to develop the yeah yet to develop to develop the language of this. Okay, and is that is that setback we see? Is that is that required by by code for the penthouse, or is that just a design decision or both? Yes, you you're required to have a one to one setback. So we actually have more than that because it's twelve feet. We have about thirteen foot four setback, I believe, and we only need twelve really. You can see that here. Okay. Got it. All right. And and still right now on eighteen oh five, that those rooftop. The current plan has those. Uh, I guess those rooftop areas. They are private. They, they, there's no internal access for the other units. Yeah, as we're showing it right now, those are private for uh, this one unit, and then. This has the three units below have private access to this entire rooftop amenity space. Um, just a note, real quick: the penthouse um, rules for the MU7 and for RA2 are different. Um, the MU7 rules are uh, even more challenging because we have to set back from all sides, not just the front and back facade, and that's why you see a very narrow um, penthouse which almost virtually made it impossible for us to have an elevator go up there. Um, so we wanted to, we didn't want to not do anything up there, but um, we wanted to uh, do whatever we could. Okay. 
I mean, is there something where if you were to ask for a special exception against that, that would allow some sort of an elevator feature so that all of the residents of the building could, could enjoy some outdoor space. There's really not much, you know, that way they could all enjoy it. And not just for, you know, a privileged few in the penthouses, literally. Um, we, we talked to um, our land use team about that. We're, we're also using Goulston stores. Um, and we didn't receive um, the, so how do I say this? The resounding confident response for um, precedent in how um, the Office of Planning and the BZA and the Zoning Commission have um, allowed relief in the, in, on penthouse setbacks. Um, we're open to, have, to continuing to have the conversation because we definitely agree we would love to be able to do it um, if we could get the support. Yeah, I mean, that's a question for the, for, for the ANC, but to me, I just like the idea of my neighbors, future neighbors having, having that nice, you know, uh, space. And then a couple of nearby apartment, um, you know, uh, condo buildings. And, you know, it's, 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 it's so nice just having that area and they've got barbecues and all the neighbors get together. So instead of just seeing your neighbors in the hallway, they're actually kind of, you know, talking to their neighbors and seeing around, you know, patio sets and the roofs of the building. And it, 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 it does help the sense of community. Well, I, I will say this though, um, and I completely agree. Um, we do have a very um, large amount of outdoor space in the front and the back. Our lot coverage um, is, is allowing for a lot of green space. And we intend to program um, the internal um, backyard as um, an amenity for our, uh, our um, the, the condo owners. And then um, we have a 20 foot building restriction line in the front on Maryland Avenue, um, which we also intend to um, landscape and be very thoughtful about. Um, so um, there, there, there will be some opportunities. It won't all be lost, but um, I totally agree. We would love to be able to activate as much outdoor space as possible for the building. Um, when is your hearing in November? Um, I'm just trying to get an under, understanding of when you will need to uh, present before the ANC and ask for a vote of, of support for the our, for, for the project. Um, sure. So our hearing is on November seventeenth. So our um, we were hoping to present next month for a vote. The following doesn't leave much time. Um, probably I think like a week before our hearing. So it's a little tight, but I think hopefully possible. Yeah, Commissioner Moore, so the 17th is the third Wednesday of the month. So, you know, if you waited until November 9th, which is the public meeting for November, that would just give us, you know, a little bit over a week to, to put together the ANC letter and support it and push it through. Alternative, you could, it's up to you. You could put them on the agenda for the October meeting. Um, that gives us a little bit of time. I'm not sure if we want, like, if you guys want to consider a change to allow more uh, shared usage of the rooftop deck. If you can figure that, if that's something we, you want to work on between now and October. We will um, contact our land use uh, team tomorrow and um, we're, we're willing to push up um, you know, vote if, um, if, if the community and the ANC is ready um, or just present and then um, in October and then go for a vote the following, whatever is uh, your preference. I think what will probably happen here is the October, November uh, structure uh, that I think we discussed previously, um, but I don't see uh, there being any issue with that because the November letter will of course be drafted prior to the meeting. Uh, so that letter will go out at least seven days in advance of the meeting. So you'll see all of the language there. Um, and then it um, you know, more than likely would be approved at that November meeting. I, I don't ever make guarantees about how votes will go, of course. 
um, but uh, just in terms of how we're handling uh, documents, uh, those documents will be drafted in advance. Okay. Um, I did notice that there was a question about um, an elevator and accessibility for the disabled um, that I wanted to address. So there will be an elevator um, and there will uh, be ADA access to this building. Thank you for, for answering that question. Thank you, Allison, for asking it. <laughs> No, I think that's all of my questions. If any other, if, do any of the other commissioners or neighbor members have any questions? Okay. Um, well, if you'd like to stop sharing, I just thank you for, for attending. Um, we have run over a lot of, we had a couple other items on the agenda tonight, on the agenda tonight. Um, but I, uh, Commissioner Moore, you had asked us to do an analysis on a project. Um, there was one at 2217 M Street. You'd also asked us to look into some plans for 807 20th Street. Uh, that was a buy right project. Some neighbors had some concerns. I don't think we're going to have, I, I don't want to keep people beyond. I want to be respectful of people's evenings here. And, um, and and call this meeting to a close. Uh, I will try to use, um, I'll send out some emails to see if we can get some answers to those questions, um, those other projects in the meantime, before yeah. uh, next month's meeting. And I, I just especially ask if we could take a look at 807 uh, 20th Street. Sure thing. You know, I had some preliminary feedback, um, but I think mostly it is just a matter of if there are any things uh, that jump out in terms of uh, technical objections, uh, since it Understood. is a buy right project. Understood. Well, um, I will, Jared, uh, Ron, Sabrina, and Sam, thank you so much for, for presenting this project. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Appreciate it. All right. Um, uh, Commissioner Moore, I'll leave it to you to. Um, uh, to the hit the stop recording button, but I just want to say <laughs> good evening, everybody, and um, hope you're all staying safe. <laughs>